Hi. Uh, once again, uh, I'm Kyung Park, uh, professor at the uh, visual art department across over there. And uh, thank you for coming again to uh, this series. Our, our lecturer today is Chris Rowe, and uh, he's the uh, he, he's the leader of. If I can call that correctly. Your cat disagrees that I called you a leader. That sounds like a, some kind of deal with North Koreans. The company is called A Dear Friend. It's based on Seoul, uh, North Korea. And uh, the lecture title is The Lights Are On, But Nobody's Home. It's, it's not exactly like, you know, Motel 6, you know, like we got to leave lights on for you. Did you get that, Chris? Okay, uh, this talk will discuss the familiar and unending battle between intuition and logic. Sounds like AI. As a graphic designer trained to always uh, do the right thing, Chris will discuss his recent struggle with doing the right thing and how not to do in the right thing has become the right thing. You got me lost here, you know? <laughs> he will discuss recent project that sits in this precarious valley somewhere in between art and design. Chris was born in 1976, God, my God, you're so young, is a designer and graphic artist. His work can be characterized, characterized by its kinetic, spatial, poetic, and atmospheric properties. Born in Seattle, Chris studied architecture. Oh, he did. I didn't know. At yeah. University of California at Berkeley. After working as both architect and a designer, he went to study graphic design at Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. This mixed background continues to influence his ex exploration, which fluctuate between two and three dimension. Obviously, uh, graphic art is two-dimensional primarily. Architecture is three-dimensional mostly. He is often at home when exploring concept in motion and space and their relationship to more static surfaces of graphic design. He recently finished research exploring concept in Korean spaces uh, uh, in Seoul National University, which is you know, kind of number one university in South Korea or Republic of Korea, if you like. His work has been exhibited all over the world and is part of the permanent collection at the Victoria Albert Museum, which is in London, and Museum de Art Decoratif, which would be in Paris, I could guess. The uh, Noi Samlong, uh, which would be, that's in Germany, right? That's and correct, yeah. You, where? It's in uh, Munich, Munich. Munich, München. And the National Hunger Museum, which I would guess that would be in Seoul, South Korea. So let's uh, welcome Chris uh, to UCSD. Thank you, Gong. Gong. Very nice uh, introduction, and thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to, again, as the title talks about, I'm going to talk a lot about um, the space between uh, intuition and logic. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start with the lecture now. Um, one second here. I've, uh... Okay. So I'm a graphic designer. I'm an artist and an educator. Um, I also teach at Hongin University here. Um, and so my life right now is pretty much divided into 33% pods. So I'm a 33% graphic designer, 33% artist, and a 33% educator. And so I'm kind of spanning all these roles all the time. And today what I'll talk about is probably more graphic design and some of my kind of experimental kind of fine art practice. So these are the two things I'm going to talk about today. Um, yeah, as the title says, uh, lights are on, no, but, but nobody's home. This is a, a, an old, uh, whatever, whatever idiom or expression that I've always been fond of. 
uh, and and I hope as I keep talking, it might make a little bit more sense. But as Kyung said, it doesn't make quite much sense now. But uh, hopefully, I'm gonna clarify some of these things as we as we continue. So the first couple projects, and and I've divided the presentation into two halves. The first half is dealing with logic, and I'd say my life as a graphic designer is very logical. So everything that I've done, everything that I do has a reason and a, a kind of um, logic and, and a kind of common sense that goes into the, uh, uh, you know, process and, and actually the implementation of a lot of the graphic design work that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, this first section will be talking about more logical projects. Uh, in the past couple years, uh, I'm sorry, I have a cat here who's very needy in the, in the morning, and so he keeps coming back and forth. So I apologize. I apologize in advance. Uh, so my recent design practice has shifted quite a bit, and I've gone towards what I call a reductive state of design. And I think I mentioned this today, and this is the first time I've mentioned this in any presentation, and I think I've mentioned this because this is um, I, th I thought it was quite apropos for the theme of this lecture series, as well as um, Kyung's recent uh, research for not only the, the Korea Pavilion of the Venice Biennale, but also um, the Sivichon project, which is a project that I, I participated on with Kyung, um, I think about two years ago or last year, was it? I don't quite remember. But um, I've recently come to this realization that design what I've been doing as a kind of uh, commercial graphic designer uh, is not kind of helping the situation actually. So, you know, we are charged with creating visual communications that can excite or, or exhilarate people. But I'm realizing too, that we have a certain uh, responsibility as designers. And I see that this endless cycle of, of, recreation and producing more and more design has become uh, perhaps problematic in some ways. So a lot of my recent designs, I've been striving for a kind of reduced state of design that I hope uh, is both uh, um, something that can grow, something that can age, something that doesn't necessarily need to change actually. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, some of these next projects that I'm showing you, I'm hoping that they can actually last for a long time. So if you look at a lot of graphic design, it's very ephemeral. It's not meant to last very long, but I'm hoping to create design that doesn't need a, a re, you know, a rebrand or a, a reinvestigation. It's a, it's a design that can last, that's very simple, that can last for a very, very long time. Um, I've also recently been doing, and, and these are some projects that I, I've actually are strangely kind of deal with the theme uh, of this lecture series. I've been working a lot on some, I guess, regenerative, regenerative projects or rehabilitative, rehabilitative projects for um, spaces in outside of Seoul. So if you know South Korea, it is an extremely Seoul-based country. I mean, Seoul is just like the mega center, if not the whole country in, in some ways. And, and we've got a lot of issues with uh, you know, neighborhoods, cities outside of Seoul, uh, population decline, people just gravitating towards Seoul in, 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 in an extreme and kind of very unbalanced way, in, in my opinion. And so I've been, you know, lucky to work on a couple of projects where the goal is to kind of uh, regenerate some interest in um, these areas outside of Seoul. So this first project is called Yonsan Culture Center. And uh, I've been working with an architect here named Hwang Sunu, uh, and he's been kind of this uh, very, he's a very charismatic uh, instigator of things. And he's been, he's kind of become this um, uh, go-to uh, person to take existing uh, places and kind of regenerate them. So what this is, this used to be an agricultural storage facility and what they wanted to do, I mean, it's just been sitting here for years. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to re, uh, you know, invigorate this space by turning it into a cultural space, actually. So you can see some of these are the before pictures. 
And so I was tasked with basically doing the branding or, or brand identity for this. Um, and uh, yeah, it, we'll just dive into it. Um, again, I've been going, working with what I call a very reduced language. Um, and, the, and again, the reason for this is I'd like a, a kind of design that again, I hope doesn't need to change. Like I hope, you know, we can keep this brand actually for 100, 200 years. Like I, I, that's that's my recent kind of goal for uh, a lot of the design work that I'm doing. So this is the actual logo and uh, it's a, it's kind of um, an acronym based logo. So if you look here, this is the two Korean characters for, uh, I guess, uh, well, what would I say? O and S, I guess, if that makes sense. So the circle being the O and this kind of triangle form being like the phonetically S-based character. And uh, if you look at it, this is, again, just a, a greatly reduced graphic language. And it's so simple that I know uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I, at least I hope uh, it's going to look just as good as it did does now, or, you know, or it's not going to age in a, in a kind of poor fashion because it's not tied to trends. It's not tied to like a, a graphic language of trends. Um, so as this is an agricultural space or agricultural storage space, these were just uh, very simple expressions of some of the motifs of the uh, brief that we got when we were actually investigating the space. And so this is the final logo itself. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, the, the the reason I'm I'm showing this project, I guess, is it's uh, it's just starting i mean this is a project that i think has just started to gain some traction in recent years um this space here is a, is a gallery and then uh within the gallery uh they've got you know wide range of uh, installation works or regular exhibitions too that come and go and uh, the program for this space, it's not only a gallery, there's an education center, there's a cafe, uh, there's a dance uh, performance, well, not a performance space, but a, a kind of dance practice space. And I know that they were talking about a brewery because originally wheat was a large uh, story for this, um, the a historical part of the space. But I, I don't know if they've gotten the permission to actually create a brewery yet, but I know that that was in the in the works, actually. And so, yeah, um, I've strangely been working a lot on a lot of these kind of projects, uh, regenerative uh, projects that are reexamining kind of dead or, or unused spaces and uh, trying to revitalize them. And I've, and I've been working again on, on a, for, from a graphic design point of view on how to, um, yeah, kind of you know, reestablish these spaces with, um, again, what I'm hoping is long lasting or, or timeless design. This is another recent project and this is very much in the beginning stages. So I don't have much to show from this, but uh, I just wanna kind of introduce this project a little bit. This is the Pangyo village of time or the Hyunam village. It's not too far from Gunsan, which is I know where, where Kyung was doing a lot of his research for the, for the Biennale. Um, this is a kind of, it's a small village and actually it had received the nickname of the village or the, the city that time had forgotten, uh, which is a, it, it's an unfortunate name, uh, an episode by a local broadcast station here. And they had nicknamed this city, you know, the, the space, the city that time had forgotten. And it's a sit, it's a name that stuck, but the residents actually hate very much because it means that the city is truly dead, like it's just stuck in time. And so uh, this project was, um, you know, kind of initiated to kind of revitalize uh, this. It's a very small neighborhood, um, but there's four uh, key kind of, um, what is it called? The uh, National uh, Heritage Monuments or, or architecture that uh, is, you know, cannot be touched or, or altered in, in a way because it is meaningful and historic. And so these uh, four kind of uh, structures have kind of created a, what they're hoping will create the, the foundations for a revitalized neighborhood or, or a city that gains 
interest again from people outside of the neighborhood or even from people from Seoul. And uh, yeah, these are just some of the examples of uh, the building. This is a, um, I think this is, this used to be a mill and uh, they hope to preserve a lot. It's, it's very fascinating. I mean, you know, it's almost all uh, as is. And if you look at the architecture planning, they are attempting to preserve a lot of the, the uh, initial infrastructure and, and, uh, and um, you know, existing uh, walls and, and columns and, and structures and whatnot. So it, it's, yeah, so the, the whole plan, you know, in theory sounds great. And, you know, it's it's in the midst of, of um, I guess, uh, you know, creation at this point or production at this point. Um, but these are just some of the spaces um, before, and I and I'm I have not been here in a couple months, so I don't know exactly how this is developing yet. So I'm I'm kind of just following along from a distance. This is an old theater here that that's quite wonderful, actually. Um, it, the, the space itself is quite fascinating, and it has this uh, very beautiful facade that um, I also feel should not be touched at all and should be kept intact as much as possible. So this is the actual logo. Um, it's based upon a small mountain there called the Hyonam Bawi. And this mountain or, or kind of hill is actually very symbolic for the local uh, residents. And so we, we took this and we wanted to do something with this. Um, so what we were thinking about was a, a kind of concept where we tie in these uh, you know, this idea about, you know, yesterday and tomorrow, you know, this, this idea about time, because we felt even though the, the nickname was unfortunate, the idea itself was quite fascinating to us, the, the idea of time as, as, a, as, a, as an integral part of the brand was also very, very much uh, something that we wanted to keep, actually. So, you know, the, the logo itself uh, became kind of two components, a kind of graphic element uh implying you know x and y z axis and and the extension or the the elongation of time as well as this uh round abstract shape that uh well not abstract actually the form is actually based upon uh you know some of the uh perceived shape of the actual uh mountain or hill there actually uh we also were uh you know Fascinated by some of the, the existing signage there. Um, this is actually a, a Tongdak house. It's a, I guess it'd be, what would that be like? A, a rotisserie chicken uh, restaurant here or, or a chicken kind of restaurant here. And so we were actually, we actually generated a new typeface uh, for this project based upon just some of the actual existing language of, of some of the signage there. So this is the typeface here in action. This is designed by a, collaborative designer Chong Young hoon who worked with me on this project actually uh, was a very talented type designer and uh yeah you can see here we are again in the in the very early phases of this but this typeface will be used actually um here uh you know in in moments of signage um for this project because it's connecting four separate um buildings or, or spaces, signage was actually a huge component of this project and how the signage would be able to visually connect all of the spaces is something we're still kind of trying to figure out. Um, but uh, yeah, this is um, in progress and, and I hope similar to the Yonsan Cultural Center, it can become something uh, that can, uh, you know, reestablish Pangyo um, or Hyonam, Hyonam Maol as a, as, a, as a really wonderful uh, historical space um, that, again, people from all over South Korea can come and visit again. This is just a segue to, I'm going to talk briefly about the identity that uh, we've been developing for uh, the Korea Pavilion uh, this year, which is uh, directed by uh, Professor Gyeong. Um, this, I somehow strangely i'd also been uh tasked with uh, creating an identity for the pavilion uh of 2021 uh the concept for this 
particular pavilion was a future school. So the director wanted to create not a traditional exhibition. Um, she wanted to use the pavilion space as a kind of rotating platform for education, for seminars, workshops, et cetera. And Professor Gyeong was also a part of this project as well. Um, and you can see this is the space itself. And so, yeah, again, same thing. It was a very reduced reductive language that I was trying to work with. Um, I was fascinated by um, some concepts that I pulled from an essay written at the start of this project by uh, the academic Alex uh, Taeguang Lee, who had written an essay. And one of the, the, the more stark images of this essay was this idea about our behavior, our irresponsible behavior towards the environment, that, you know, eventually creating a black sun, like the sun actually eventually being um, no longer the sun that it is, but just totally uh, a, a, a blacked out sun that has rendered our world in, in a very dark state, actually. So, you know, as as dark as that sounds, I, I thought this was a very apropos symbol for this project, actually. And, the, and if you can look at the graphic language again, it's very simple. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to create uh, a kind of open branding platform where all this various kind of content over the weeks of the Biennale could actually come through and be part of the, the brand system itself. Um, yeah. This is also very much in progress. Um, I don't know if Kyung has, uh, Professor Kyung has shown much of this, but... Uh, I'll just talk very briefly about it. It's still very much in progress. This is um, an identity system for this year's event. And similarly, I was inspired by Professor Kyung's writing. Um, he had mentioned, you know, so the concept is, is, a, is a 2086, what will happen in the year 2086? And again, um, one of the, the, the concepts that I really gravitated was this idea about post-progress. So we are in a state of, um, yeah, we, you know, it, we're kind of after progress now, and now we are in a, what I think should be a more reflective state of the, the things that we're doing and the things that eventually will, will happen because of our actions, actually. So this uh, abstract graphic, a, a lot of it actually is based upon the original Civichon identity, but it, it's gone further into the Civichon identity where these uh, lines that are expressive of perhaps progress or, or, or uh, you know, our kind of uh, human innovation and, and machine industrial uh, thinking and the degradation of that over time, actually, the, the slow and eventual degradation of that over time, actually. So, again, this is a very, this is a very simple um, identity system. But uh, it is again one that um, is following what I what I'm calling now a, a reductive state of design, and a design that I hope can last for a long time. And uh, yeah, this is very much in the middle phases now. Um, but I hope all of you guys can visit Venice at one point and see uh, what's in store. I'm not going to reveal much more. I'm pretty sure Professor Gyeong has talked about this uh, quite a bit. But um, yeah, okay. Now I'm going to move into the next phase of the, the presentation, which is um, intuition. So I am constantly struggling, I think, between these two worlds. And um, intuition is something that I've become very fascinated in as well in the past couple of years. So my design interest has gone towards a very reductive state of design. But my other fascination has become intuition uh the things that perhaps just don't make sense actually so it became very apparent uh about 10 no about 11 years ago this is a villa a typical kind of housing unit in korea it's a three or four story unit and uh this is the villa that was built right across from my old place and if you look here it's brand new it's a brand new villa if you look here between the second and third floor, there's a small piece of tape here, okay? This tape, uh, I would see this tape every day when I went to work. And after a while, 
this tape started to really bother me. Like I just, it just bothered me so much because this building is brand new. And I begin to think, why the, why is there this tape there? Like it's just making me crazy. Like I just, I was thinking, you know, this is a brand new building. Why don't they just get rid of this tape? Why is this tape there? And then I begin to think about it. I begin to think, why does this tape bother me so much? Because actually, this tape is actually quite helpful in some ways. I mean, this is a very bland, very standard, you know, typical kind of building in Korea. And at least the tape is adding something to this building. You know, it, it adds a bit of flavor or personality or or what have you. And um, I don't know. I, I just begin to think, oh, my God, maybe I've become this kind of machine like design person and everything has to have a reason. Everything must make sense. And this tape being there, not making sense, bothering me, that was a clear indication that perhaps uh, I had I had lost my way, I think. So if you look here, this tape is, is so this is 2012. And even though I moved away from this neighborhood, I go back just to see if that tape is still there. And it, it is still there. Uh, 2016, it's still there. And it's amazing. It's it's a kind of sign. It became like a symbolic sign for me, this little piece of tape, that um, there's something good in the world with these things that don't make sense, you know? So... I haven't been there in the last uh, two years. I got to make my kind of annual trip back to the neighborhood and I got to see if that tape is still there, but it is still there as of 2021. And so because of this, I started to become fascinated with everything that doesn't make sense, like more of these intuitive things. Uh, and I began to find that these words that our society typically has embraced, efficiency, accuracy, accuracy speed, perfection, you know, I started to get bothered by these words and I started to find the opposites much more fascinating inefficiency inaccuracy incorrectness imperfection and so this began what I'd call a kind of rabbit hole um, into again intuition I've been exploring intuition at, uh, in depth now and it's become a very fascinating part of my what I call my artistic practice um, this is a project called idiot uh, which I'm going to fly through and this is the kind of beginning of this project I with a couple of friends, we began exploring things to kind of break our kind of logical thinking. So for this project, for about a month, we only worked with our left hands, intentionally try to, trying to create awkward conditions or, or conditions where we could kind of lose our, our perfection, perfectionist kind of attitude or, or um, our, our machine-like thinking in some way. This is Idiot 2. This is, again, in the same series. For about a month, we tried to make things without even using our eyes. So we, we closed our eyes and we just started making through a kind of blind process. And again, the goal was to, to try to make things, again, with without having the kind of burden of having it be beautiful or having it be, you know, exceptional in some way or perfect in some way, you know? So I, I, I became, became much more fascinated in this idea about intuition. Uh, and this is another kind of a moment of, a, of epiphany for me. This is a concert I saw with three artists, uh, musicians here. And uh, what I noticed was, okay, so the artist on the left and the artist on the right, they had created these machines, uh, these instruments. For making music and they're, they're really fascinating they're really amazing they're totally experimental machines the artist there in the middle his name is alfred hart he is playing, playing the bass clarinet and he's been playing the bass clarinet for years and so when i was watching this it suddenly hit me you know when alfred was playing may sound totally crazy um but it felt like he pulled out his soul and he said hey this is my soul you know here it is you can experience my soul i know that sounds really crazy but i i had a, a clear moment at that point in time that i wanted to do the same i wanted to know something so well i wanted to master something so well 
that I too could at any moment pull out my soul and just give it to you or hand it to somebody and let somebody experience my soul, actually. I know, I know that sounds very crazy, but it became a, a huge desire of mine. So um, I decided at that time I wanted to go deep into something. I wanted to really go deep into something. I really wanted to know something extremely well to the point that I could, I could, could, it could become an expressive mechanism where I could pull again, pull these things out of myself, these, these deep things out of myself. So I started to go back to some of the things that I was uh, constantly experimenting with for years, and this is one of them. Um, I always had loved this crappy printing, like, you know, the things that came out of your printer that were totally effed up or just messed up. And again, the same, it's for the same reasons. I, I just found these to be much more interesting than perfect prints. Um, so these are like, you know, when your toner is gone, when you've got a crappy Xerox image, you know, when your scan is incorrect, like these kind of things started to fascinate me. Um, and so I, I started, this became the rabbit hole. I started to just go deeper into this rabbit hole again with the intention of, of trying to be deep, trying to learn something deeper. So I started, I got the idea, oh, maybe if these are not letter size prints, maybe if I blow these up, what happens? So these, I started to play with the scale of these. And then I started to play with the printing techniques. Uh, maybe I can use different kind of inks or different kind of papers and, and not only play with size and scale, but also play with how they're actually um, executed or, or the kind of material quality of these. Um, and then I had this other idea. Oh my God, maybe I could actually create frame sequences from these. And so this is the very first frame sequence I met. It's a very rough six frame sequence, but I thought, oh, these prints actually can actually reverse themselves back into motion graphics or, or digital design in some way. And so that became a, a kind of new series of works um, where I started just playing with these kind of totally inefficient, kind of stupid animations actually. And I didn't really know what I was doing with these. But I just kind of kept making them, again, for the whole purpose of trying to go deep into something, trying to understand something very deeply. And so after making a bunch of these, my friend actually, one day he said, hey, Chris, you know what? I think I can hear something, man. And I was like, that's, that's pretty interesting. Like, what do you hear? He's like, I don't know. But when I see this, I feel like I can hear something, like something, you know, something I don't know what it is, but I, I think I can hear something. And when I heard this, I was like, oh, my God, that's kind of amazing, man. You know, like I made something that without thinking about any sound or anything, but that this person felt sound was extremely liberating, actually. And so I, I thought, oh, my God, this is this could be something as well. And so I kept going with these. And then, you know, while doing this, I also started to look up, you know, interviews with with musicians and sound artists and you know the, the thing that i found that was so fascinating was that nobody ever asked these musicians you know what why did you make this sound why did you make this this song like this like what is what is the reason for doing that and you know as you know in visual art or or design graphic design everybody's asking what is the reason why it is you know what is the purpose of this what does this mean you know and i just suddenly felt so liberated i felt oh my god Maybe I can, you know, maybe this is this is this is freedom for me. Maybe I can actually, you know, make in a way that again, it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to have a meaning. And again, it can be totally intuitive, actually. So the sound series is continuing um, for better or for worse, but I feel that it's getting better and it and it keeps evolving in a lot of ways. Um but again, yeah, it has been a very liberating process in some ways. I'm going to just keep flying through these. Okay, so my practice these days is a, is a real wide mix of, I would say, animation, components of printmaking, drawing and painting, uh, and also some components of what I call spatial design, which I'm going to go to in, the, in a little bit here. Um, and I'm going to just fly through these because um, I'm going to run out of time. So 
I would call it a hybrid practice. And um, yeah, it's it's really kind of, you know, multifarious in some ways. Um, this is a project and it's going to lead to my last section here, which I'm going to kind of fly through in order to, to finish on time here. Um, I became interested, you know, further as an extension of my background in architecture in both space and again, trying to break these kind of logical systems. So this is a project that was commissioned by a, a hotel here in Seoul called Rise Hotel. Um, and for this project, I thought it'd be fun to explore numbers. Um, I, you know, as you guys know, I, I'm a quite intuitive person. So I was always terrible at math, engineering, science. And I never liked the fact that numbers were always just numbers. Like the number two is just number two. There's no like variation on that at all. And I thought it'd be interesting. What if I explore these couple numbers, a set of numbers in a, in a more intuitive way? So this is a series of explorations of the number three. And this eventually became a, a, a public kind of installation. So there's a small alley next to this hotel and, and the hotel had asked me if I could come and create something for this alley. So I had created uh, this, I guess this could be called like a wall graphic or a mural in some way or an installation. It's kind of a mix of all, all three, I think. Um, but I wanted to use the language of signage as well, which is also something I wanted to break. Signage, as you know, is always text space and just communicating something. But I thought it'd be fascinating to make signage without any kind of text communication, without any language. So this is a huge uh, kind of light box that is existing in this alley. And uh, this is the first part of the series, which is exploring the, the number three. This is the second part of the series, which is exploring the number two. This is the uh, third part of the series, which is exploring the number one. And so, yeah, uh, again, it's a, it's a simple project trying to, again, explore a kind of breaking down of, of logic and numbers uh, and also exploring how uh, my graphics or graphic work could also create kind of emotional or intuitive experiences within a space, actually. So this continued uh, during this project in, in a kind of adjacent space there in the hotel. Uh, there's a shoe company called Vans, which I think is based there in Orange County. Uh, it might be in San Diego. I'm not sure where. But they had become familiar with my work through this hotel. And they had asked if I could create a similar kind of um, graphic, kind of wall graphic for the space, actually. So this is a, it's a giant graphic. And... Um, this was actually done in a in an almost completely stupid way as well. This is this was created through thirty one different silk screens, which you may know as a kind of laborious process. But uh, we needed to use silk screen because I had this kind of very specific texture that that comes from my kind of poor printing processes that I wanted to transition to the wall. So this is a gigantic wall uh, that was created with all these different silk screen silk screens. In a, in a printing process. So it's actually printing on a gigantic wall, uh, which again, looking back is probably not the smartest thing, but again, I'm not into these kind of smart things these days. And so, yeah, this is the, the kind of finished wall actually. Okay, um, I've got a few minutes left, so I'm just gonna fly through this last section. So this has also led to what I would call an expansion of this rabbit hole or going deeper into this rabbit hole. And I've just, and I think this is my former architect. Um, I am what you might call a failed architect. I only lasted for about a year at an architecture firm. Uh, I just, uh, I just, and, and I apologize. I'm sure there's a lot of architects here. I just, it, it was, the process was too complicated for me. And, um, too involved and, the, and the, 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 the timeline was just too long for me in some ways, actually. So I, I, I'm a failed architect, I gave up. But I think some of um, that intuition, that, that intuition for space is still there. So a lot of my recent kind of exhibition installation work is, is uh, very specifically trying to engage 
with the space in a kind of different way or, or different ways to kind of experience space. So this is an exhibit I did about two years ago at a space called DP in Seoul. And for this space, I thought it'd be interesting to have nothing on the walls and put all my work just on the ground. And so this is a, a spatial installation where people could come in, walk in and around the work and uh, see the work uh, from a different perspective. Um, this particular exhibition, again, was about traces and about thieves, actually. It's, a, it's another concept that I, I don't have time to talk about today. But this thieves subject is something that I've always been extremely fascinated by, um, particularly in terms of graphic design and mechanical reproduction and our ability to produce things over and over and over again. And so, yeah, the works were all scattered across the floor. Uh, it's a combination, again, of animation, um, video work, as well as, again, this hybrid practice of, of print, painting, and, and drawing work. Um, yeah. This last year, I did another exhibit of Thebes, um, and this was done uh, again, this time in three spaces, uh, one called Segungan, another one called Shi, which is operated and uh, directed by Che Gyeong Jung, who is another lecturer on this series, who's also involved in the, in the, the Korean pavilion this year. And again, the same thing here, uh, I, in some ways, the space became a canvas for me. And so this is the first time ever I went totally intuitive. So I just brought these pieces into the space. And much like the space being a canvas, I just started to construct these things in the space with very little planning, very little uh, initial concept or, or uh, intention with the space itself, actually. Um, so that was Hegongan. This is actually the Xi space in Incheon. And the Xi space is actually a, a video or film or motion space. So this space, intentionally, I had sought to create something darker or, you know, made something where the actual video would stand out or, or pop out in a, in, a, in a more kind of dynamic way. And so this installation for the space was very, very dark. And uh, I had tried to create um, kind of a yellow space. Um, and yeah, I, I could talk about the yellow a little bit later. And the third space itself was the internet. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to, again, revisit some of these old things that I'm always fascinated about. So I designed a website that intentionally tried to feel like uh, a, a late 90s or early 2000s website. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to wrap this up. This is the most recent exhibit. I'm doing this right now with, it's a two-person show with the artist Jung Oh or Oh Jung. And uh, this is the Chemanlin Museum. It's in Seongbukdong here in Seoul. And this is the space of a former sculptor who had donated his house and his studio to the district of Songbuk. And it's now a museum there. And so what we were tasked to do, uh, we were selected because both of us work in a very spatial way. So they had asked us to come and converse with the space and to create something together, almost like a three-person show with Chim Anlin, who's the, the, the deceased artist, and with Jong and I myself, to create uh, some kind of uh, exhibition that was um, expressive of a dialogue or a conversation with the space. So yeah, I'm just gonna wrap up here. These are some of the uh, kind of larger scale, uh, you know, print painted pieces that, uh, that I, I'm kind of, again, expanding. I'm trying to figure out better ways to kind of work with them in space. And the lights themselves are from the work of uh, the this very wonderful artist named Jung Oh. And again, I think this is a really fascinating project. Um, it's fascinating for me because I think this is the first time I realized, actually, I do talk to spaces. I know this sounds a little bit nuts too, um, but here I had had many conversations with the space and it was a weird conversation because the space itself kept telling me not to second guess myself. So all these places and the decisions that I made are almost exactly like my very first intuition. So it was funny, the space kept correcting me. Like I went back and I kept thinking, ah, maybe I should do that. And it was like a weird godlike voice and the space kept saying, you know, hey, Chris, 
why do you keep going back on your agreement? We had agreed this would be good. Please remember such things. Like it was talking like that. It's really strange. But it was a again very wonderful process. And this exhibition is actually happening right now. Um, and again, it's it's the latest in a, in a series of what I think is, I'm hoping is is a blooming kind of uh, spatial practice as well. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. Um, thank you for putting up with the, what I hope is a talk that kind of makes sense. Um, again, I'm I'm working in all different kinds of ways. Um, as part of this lecture series, I'm, I'm very fascinated with projects that are, are investigating or, you know, rethinking some of these forgotten locations, uh, non-urban locations. But I'm also fascinated with intuition and things that maybe don't make sense and perhaps how you can also use these things and create also uh, public or, or spatial kind of experience as well. Some questions? Is the is the a dear friend thing the website exhibit that you were discussing, or was that unrelated? Or are we able to access that one scrolling website exhibit you were showing near the end? Yeah, I mean the ax the website is of a dear friend, but I'm really sorry I haven't updated it since 2017, so it's really old works. My other website, Chris Roda Kr, has some of the more kind of illogical, uh, yeah intuitive works. I'm going to try to update a dear friend soon, but I, you know, I, I've been meaning to get to it, but um, I, I haven't done so yet. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. My question was regarding your project with the numbers. Um, what yes. was your design process when designing numbers um, without using language? Um, so, okay, it's, um, again, this is probably the probably a very Luddite or very stupid way to work on things. But I just started to work uh, initially just in components of three or just in components of two or just in components of one. So I thought I'd make a kind of rule-based system, even though I don't like rules that much, and just isolate these visual exercises to these numbers and just explore what I was curious. So I first started with the number three, and I was just curious if you could actually feel three or see three, you know, in a different kind of way. So, you know, you, you just look at the number three and it's a three, but I was wondering if you look at these three components and I was working a lot in animation at the time, how these three components, you know, if, if you looked at this relationship that was created by the animation, if people could actually see the three uh, or, or feel the three in a different kind of way. Um, so the actual work, there's actually a, a television uh, next to the installation inside the hotel, actually, where, you know, where the motion pieces, and there's also another television on the outside uh, next to the installation. So it, it was, it's not just the, the, the sign itself or the, the kind of graphic wall itself, but there was a motion component as well. So yeah, I, I, I it's not a very fantastic explanation, but, you know, it, it was basically just trying to use some of my existing kind of, um, graphic language and, and, and trying to express three, two, or one in, in, yeah, in a kind of more, F, F, you know, atmospheric way or, or kind of more, yeah, emotional or, or intuitive way, actually. I don't, does that make sense? I don't know if that may, that might not make much sense, actually, but. Well, uh, Chris, I mean, uh, your work is, uh, your work is very beautiful. Let's say that's kind of cliche word, but um, they seem to have some uh, emotion or life. They, they, the pieces or objects that you create seems to be alive. You know, so it makes sense about how you're trying to find some soul in it, from it. But they're also uh, uh, very uh, colors are really uh, great colors. They are actually largely very primary base colors, and uh, uh, they're very bright, uh, and uh, uh, they're uh, they're singular colors mostly, right? Right. So it's very uh, simple. Of course, you use black and white at this as well, equally as important to you, and uh, uh, 
But uh, the other thing I noticed is that they're all very much rounded shape. There's not very many straight, sharp, uh, or even jagged or very aggressive. They're very soft, you know. Uh, and uh, in some ways, that's kind of, let's say, uh, I wouldn't say unusual, but it's not very common these days. Uh, and whether that, uh, how do, how do, do you have any thought, psychotherapy yourself about this? Why that you tend to go that direction? Is that something that your cat could actually answer for you? Uh, that's actually a, a good point, Kyung. I, I think my cat could answer that better, actually, because I don't really know why. Um, and maybe psychotherapy uh, is the next step for me. That that might be the next step. Um, <laughs> I I don't know why. I just like these round shapes. But I do like the tension between, you know, more mechanical design type of shapes and, and whatnot as well. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think you're right. Um, I need some help. I, I need to, and I, I may not understand why I do the things that I do, but I don't know. For, for whatever reason, these round shapes just feel right to me, and, and I, I just can't explain it, actually. So Are you, I think that's a good... Yeah, that's good. I, I'm gonna. The cat think thing is it. good because I right, think the right. cat probably knows better than myself. Actually, are, are you coming to Venice? No. I can't. I, you can't, I can't. Right? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I might be able to go in the summer, um, but you know, I would love to see it. I'm so curious. You know, it's been a long couple months. I'm so curious how how. Well, you know. Turn out. Yeah. We're, we're. I'm coming in September in Korea, so we can talk about your. Your round problem, okay? <laughs> but uh, the uh, I I I really appreciate today. We had some get people from attending the lecture from outside of class. Let's say that's really great. In fact, a family came. That's amazing. <laughs> that's really wonderful. That's fantastic. Um, but uh, I want to tell you next week uh, the lecture will be uh, Yun Jae Beck. And he's going to talk a completely different thing about it, which is that uh, rural uh, organic farming communities in South Korea in rural villages, and how uh, people from the city, as, as uh, uh, Chris explained, so a metropolitan area has 21, almost 22 million people out of 52 million Korean population. Actually, no, wait a minute. That's, I think it's more, actually. I think now it's like 52% of South Koreans live in Seoul metropolitan area, right? Out of 52 million people, uh, and 52% uh, and of South Korean lives in high-rise apartments. So South Koreans love 52, right? But uh, they are moving toward the countryside. Slow, very small. But interestingly, they're Retired people, obviously, you would think they're going back to their, let's say, hometown. And then middle-aged people who are fed up with urban life and wants to find a different way to live, which is like farming, right? And then there are younger pe young people, 20s, moving out there as well, uh, thinking maybe they can do start something entrepreneur their own business or digital nomad kind of you know as well so this is kind of return to the village movement Gichon, return to farming movement kinong and that's what the next lecture is going to be about so please come okay uh thanks chris and uh, great to see you in the same setup with your cat and your uh, book book stand behind you and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Nice